Hello everyone and thank you for joining us. My name is Carla Wohl and I will be moderating this special webinar. It has been one year since President Obama signed into law the Affordable Care Act and on this one year anniversary it remains controversial and the subject of much debate. Today Dr. Gerald Gaminsky, one of the nation's leading experts in health policy, will help us separate the fact from the fiction. He will talk about features of the bill that are already in effect, efforts underway to implement other aspects of the bill, and attempts to delay its implementation. After the lecture, he'll take your questions. On the left-hand side of your screen, there is a text box where you can type questions either as they occur to you during the lecture or afterwards in the question and answer part of the webinar. So let's get started. Jerry? Uh, thank you, Carla. It's my pleasure to be here today to talk uh, with you about the one-year anniversary of the signing of the uh, Affordable Care Act. Um, uh, before I get into sort of the, the substance of the talk, I, I think I'd like to start with sort of a personal observation, and it may be a sentiment shared by many of you um, today on the webinar. Uh, and a, a year ago, um, I think that there was a, a great deal of, of expectation uh, hope and exhilaration uh, given that after more than a hundred years of effort uh, the United States had finally passed a health reform bill which although it did not guarantee universal access to health insurance uh, came as close as, as we've ever been uh, in the history of this country to uh, including and guaranteeing health in access to health insurance for uh, virtually all Americans. Uh, one year later we stand uh, here today, uh, no longer celebrating that victory, uh, but I think uh, stunned by a sense uh, that uh, this bill is under serious attack, uh, that there still seems to be uh, considerable confusion about uh, what is in the bill, uh, how it will affect many Americans, and um, in addition, concern that or at least the perception among some that the bill has actually been repealed. Uh, uh, latest figures uh, indicate that about a quarter of Americans think that the bill has been repealed as a result of the recent vote that took place in the House. Uh, and up to another quarter uh, of Americans polled uh, are uncertain about whether the, the bill is still the law of the land. So I think uh, today what I'd like to do is explore uh, some of these issues uh, review um, the accomplishments of the uh, bill during the, the first year of implementation, and then talk about I think uh, what I'd consider to be some of the the ongoing challenges and political differences uh, related to the successful implementation of the Affordable Care Act. So uh, what I'd like to do is start by reviewing a slide that I presented in an earlier. Uh, presentations, just summarizing some of the uh, provisions of the bill that, that went into effect uh, towards the end of 2010. And these are changes that uh, have begun to impose regulations on private insurance markets. Uh, they went into effect for, on the first policy year starting on or after September 23, 2010. And uh, so these provisions for uh, most Americans are now in place because as I think most people know, uh, uh, insurance policy years tend to run along uh, calendar years. Uh, and so for most people, these benefits uh, and changes in the insurance market went into effect on January 1st of 2011. Uh, all private plans and policies now uh, uh, have uh, must eliminate uh, unnecessary policy cancellations or rescissions. Uh, policies and plans can no longer have lifetime dollar limits on benefits. And policy, family policies must extend coverage for children up to age 26. Now, these three provisions of the bill uh, provide important protections uh, for individuals, but one of my themes today is that many of the provisions of the bill that have gone into effect so far are not necessarily affecting a large percentage of the population, although they provide very important protections for people who have had their health care um, policies canceled or who have had, uh, who have uh, exceeded their lifetime limits on benefits. Uh, 
I don't have good data today to share with you on the number of either Californians or, or um, Americans subject to, to policy cancellations or to dollar limits. But the best data that I've seen and the best sort of estimates is that with regard to policy cancellations that upwards of three or 4,000 Californians a year, for example, uh, are subject to uh, policy cancellations or rescissions prior to the implementation of this provision. With regard to lifetime dollar limits on benefits, um, the best estimate that I've seen is that approximately a third of Americans uh, had policies that had lifetime dollar limits on benefits. Um, of course, the relevant information or data there would be what's my probability or likelihood of exceeding that benefit? Uh, and unfortunately, we don't have a good estimate of the, the uh, percentage of that roughly 100 million Americans who had lifetime dollar limits. Uh, what percentage of those exceed those benefits? Um, with regard to children, extending children's coverage, this is something that's had uh, much more of an immediate impact and has been felt by a broader uh, uh, segment of society. Uh, the estimate in California is that about uh, two 200,000 um, uh, adult children have been eligible for this benefit. Uh, but again, it's not clear how many people have actually been added to their parents' policies. Um, I'm sure that that better data estimates will become available over time. But as of right now, we have better information about who's eligible as opposed to who's actually taking advantage of these benefits. Um, other provisions that went into effect last September, uh, the elimination of pre-existing condition exclusions for children uh, uh, under age 19, and the elimination of restrictive annual dollar limits on benefits. Um, again, uh, we don't necessarily have great data on the number of Californians or Americans uh, who have actually benefited from these changes, but the, we do know that approximately almost slightly less than 600,000 children um, under age 19 in California have pre-existing conditions, uh, so are, will potentially benefit, but we don't have a good count of how many to date have benefited from this change in the law. Uh, and then finally, uh, the last section on this slide indicates requirements for all new plans and policies, including uh, coverage for preventive services uh, at no cost uh, to the, to the um, insured, uh, implementation of an appeals process, um, the provision to allow pediatricians and OBGYNs to serve as primary care providers, and provision to allow use of ER services without pre-authorization. Um, of all of these um, uh, provisions required of new policies, the uh, requirement for preventive services is probably the one that has, will be felt by the largest portion uh, of the population because uh, virtually everyone receives some sort of preventive care uh, and um, as a result, those services will no longer be subject to copayments or deductibles. So uh, the picture that I want to paint here is that here's a, a, a sort of a, a comprehensive list of changes that have taken place uh, since the enactment of the bill. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, many of these provisions went into effect for, for the vast majority of policyholders on January 1st of 2011. Um, we don't necessarily have good information about the number of people who actually felt the benefit of, of these, but uh, to set the stage for um, discussion uh, later and points that I'll be reinforcing later, I, I would suggest that the fact that these important patient protections that have gone into place, the fact that they are not necessarily being experienced by a broad segment of the population is one of the political challenges that the uh, Affordable Care Act is facing one year after implementation. And I can, uh, uh, I'll elaborate on that point uh, later. Uh, other uh, provisions that have gone into effect um, since the enactment of the bill, uh, one is the closing of uh, the the process of closing the Medicare Part D donut hole. 
Um, here's a case where we have uh, somewhat better information about the number of Californians who've benefited. The estimate is almost 350,000 Californian uh, seniors and Medicare recipients benefited from rebates um, last year. And this year, those individuals will be eligible for 50% uh, discounts uh, on their uh, brand name drugs when they reach the donut hole. Uh, the process of closing the donut hole is going to be a 10-year transition. It will be fully closed in 2020. Uh, but here's a case where uh, the impact of, of the uh, ACA is being felt by a, a larger segment of the population. Uh, the elimination of cost sharing provisions for Medicare preventive services sort of mirroring the changes that are taking place in the private insurance market. This potentially has a huge impact in California, over 4 million um, Medicare beneficiaries should be feeling uh, the, uh, the benefit of this elimination of cost sharing uh, this year. Uh, small business tax credits have been in effect f uh, since the enactment of the bill and were, uh, small businesses were eligible for tax credits beginning in the 2010 tax year. Um, the estimate is that uh, somewhere on the order of 300,000 small businesses uh, uh, are eligible for, for uh, these tax credits. Uh, but again, we don't have a good estimate as to how many employees and how many firms have actually taken these tax credits up. Uh, that information will probably become available later this year for the first time. Uh, medical loss ratios. This is a provision of the bill that uh, a lot of people don't seem to know about. Um, insurers have to meet standards for uh, their medical loss ratios uh, in the individual and small group market. Insurers have to pay out at least 80 cents on every dollar they collect in as premium revenue. And in the large group market, they have to pay out at least 85 cents on every dollar they collect as, as premium revenue starting this year. Um, firms that fail to do this will have to issue rebates to come into compliance with, their, with the standards. Um, and um, although many insurers are currently in compliance with these requirements, it's possible that uh, uh, thousands of uh, uh, individuals could receive rebate checks as a result of this, this new requirement. Uh, premium rate review um, is in the process of being uh, implemented nationwide. California has received a, a million dollar grant to strengthen its rate review process. Um, and um, is currently in the process of developing a more transparent rate review uh, mechanism. Uh, state law uh, uh, SB 1163 was passed last year, and, uh, towards the end of last year, um, to authorize this rate review process. And currently, there's an, a, another bill that's been introduced into the legislature to increase the uh, regulatory authority of the state uh, review process uh, to actually allow state agencies to deny unreasonable rate requests. Current law uh, simply requires that rates be reviewed, and a judgment can be issued about the reasonableness of that request. But unreasonable requests, um, the state currently does not have the authority to deny those rate requests. Um, the pre-existing condition insurance plan, this is uh, up and running in California. Uh, the estimate is that there are uh, something on the order of 200,000 Californians who are potentially eligible for this. These are individuals, um, basically adults, who uh, cannot find affordable insurance because of their pre-existing condition. This insurance pool was set up um, to serve as a bridge to reform. and. Unfortunately, only about 1,350 Californians are, are currently enrolled in the program. Enrollment in this has been very slow, uh, and one of the the uh, uh, one of the uh, reasons uh, apparently is because although the premiums are subsidized, um, they are not subsidized at the same level as premiums will be in the insurance exchanges. So uh, apparently, uh, individuals are still experiencing difficulties paying for these premiums uh, in this insurance plan. But this was viewed as, a, as an important transition step, and um, yet 
is experiencing very low enrollment as, as of uh, uh, last month. Finally, there's another provision that's not very well known in the bill. Uh, it's the Early Retirement Reinsurance Program. This is basically support and subsidies to employers to provide uh, retiree health benefits to uh, their former employees um, who have retired before reaching uh, eligibility for Medicare. Uh, and the latest data suggests that less than 500 Californians are enrolled in this program. So again, uh, I want to emphasize that one of the themes is that we're moving forward. Uh, important provisions of the bill are being enacted, but what we're seeing is, at least in some cases, extremely low participation and low awareness of uh, programs that um, uh, potentially thousands of additional Californians are, uh, are eligible for under reform. Uh, finally, let me uh, comment in terms of progress um, in implementation, the progress in establishing the insurance exchanges. Uh, California was the first state to enact legislation creating the California Health Benefit Exchange. Uh, there were two bills passed last year by the legislature, complementary bills uh, establishing the exchange. Uh, the exchange is, is going to be governed by a five-member board, four of whom have been appointed. Two were appointed by former Governor Schwarzenegger. So uh, Kim Belshay and Susan Kennedy were appointed be before the governor left office. Uh, current Secretary of Health and Human Services, Diane Dooley, uh, will, has been appointed and serves ex officio, um, a voting uh, ex officio member of the board. And then two other appointments are by the state legislature. Uh, Paul Fearer was recently appointed about two weeks ago by the Assembly Speaker Perez. Uh, and the Senate appointee is uh, still to be announced or to be named um, in the near future. Uh, but this uh, uh, board uh, and uh, uh, the uh, the board will play an extremely important role in getting California's uh, exchange up and running over the next two years, uh, two to three years as we transition to 2014. Uh, they have a lot of work to do, um, but the state has also applied for uh, support that's available uh, under the Affordable Care Act to. Um, basically build this infrastructure uh, and um, when the final appointment is made, this board will uh, be off and running. So uh, let me switch gears now. Uh, I've tried to provide a summary of where we are with regard to implementing key provisions of the bill. Of course, I just want to remind everybody that uh, the major uh, major aspects of health care reform won't be implemented until 2014. The exchanges won't be up and running until 2014. And subsidies uh, for purchasing insurance in the exchange start then. Uh, and the expansion of Medicaid um, uh, will, will take place then as well. So there are major provisions of the bill that um, are still almost three years away. And um, as a result, I think that sets the stage for a discussion now um, uh, of what is going on with regard to public opinion uh, related to health care reform and why uh, public support seems to be eroding. Um, so looking at uh, this, uh, the, the current slide, um, and this is a poll conducted by the Kaiser Family Foundation um, just a few weeks ago. Um, they've been conducting this, uh, these polls, as you can see on the slide, for um, uh, well over a year now, for almost two years. And um, so we've got interesting trend line data. Uh, in response to the question, do you think the country as a whole will be better off or worse off under the new health care reform law, or that it won't make much of a difference? You can see that um, two years ago, in February of 2009, almost 60% of those polled believe that health care reform would make the country as a whole better off. And it's, uh, you can see the decline in that support um, over the year leading up to the actual enactment of the bill. And since the enactment of the bill, you can see further erosion in uh, agreement with the statement that, this, that the bill will, in fact, um, produce uh, or make the country better off. I think what's equally um, uh, uh, 
sort of disturbing in this uh, trend is that the uh, simultaneously as uh, public support um, uh, or agreement with the statement uh, has eroded, uh, a number of people now believe that the, the country will be worse off as a result. Uh, that seems to have peaked right around the time that the bill was passed at about 35 percent, but is uh, drifting slowly upwards so that um, it we're almost equally divided according to the poll regarding whether the, the bill will make the country better off or worse off. Um, in response to another question in the poll uh, about reform, um, when asked whether people have generally a favorable or unfavorable view of reform, you can see that uh, over the course of the last year, and apparently this question wasn't asked until after the bill was actually enacted, but um, the uh, the perspective has, has sort of bounced around over the last year um, in the, the period uh, right after enactment of the bill uh, is when support uh, and favorable perspective of the bill was at its at its highest at 50 percent in July of 2010, and you can see that it's continued to bounce around. But since October, has sort of leveled off at around 40 to 42 um, percent simultaneously. Um, the unfavorable perspective on the bill has increased, particularly since the election in November. Uh, and spiked it at 50% of those polled in January of 2011, uh, but has been uh, uh, declining somewhat in the months since then. Now, uh, looking at uh, support uh, uh, according to party identification, um, of course, I don't think that this information will be surprising to anybody in the audience, but uh, Democrats, independents, and Republicans view health care reform cons in, from a quite different perspective. Um, Democratic support um, is uh, relatively strong. Independents are um, almost equally divided, but t uh, trending towards an unfavorable uh, view of health care reform. And um, Republicans, um, very a very, very small percentage of Republicans um, view health care reform favorably at this point. Uh, the Kaiser Family Foundation asked uh, individuals uh, about their feelings about the health care reform bill. And one of the options was um, that um, it uh, makes me angry. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, among individuals who report that they are angry about health care reform, which has remained relatively constant over the last um, 12 months or so, roughly about 30 percent of those polled respond that they're angry about health care reform. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the survey asked a follow-up question to determine what the source of that anger is, and specifically is it um, about health care reform or is it uh, indicative of, of other uh, uh, problems uh, with the direction of the country. And the pie chart, I think, it, it provides an interesting uh, piece of information that's really only about 18 percent of those who report feeling angry about health care reform, that that anger is focused specifically on health care. Um, the other, the vast majority of individuals who are angry about health care reform are generally angry about the direction in, in Washington and that health care reform is just one of many things that they are upset about. Uh, it seems to be the convenient target right now, but it's not uh, per se um, what is troubling them about the, the current administration. Uh, I believe this, uh, I apologize, I think that this slide I've already talked about, I'm not sure uh, I think I made a mistake to have this in here again, so let me skip this and move on to the next one. Um, Kaiser asked uh, individuals about whether or not they will be better off or worse off um, under health care reform. Um, 
And again, you can see that uh, since the enactment of the law, uh, there's been continued erosion in the perspective of those polled about whether they'll be better off or not. Um, as of March of this year, um, uh, a few weeks ago, about 26% of those polled felt that they would be better off, 30% worse off, and uh, fully 40% of those polled, 39%, indicated that the, uh, the bill is not going to make much difference for them. So in order to assess whether or not uh, there is support for individual provisions of the bill um, or not, Kaiser asked a series of questions about whether uh, there's support for expanding the law, keeping the law as it is, uh, repealing it and replacing it with the, a Republican-sponsored alternative, or just repealing the law and, and living with the status quo. And again, this won't be surprising to anybody in the audience, but Democrats, independents, and Republicans uh, are on sort of polar opposite ends with regard to this. Almost 50% of Democrats report that the law should be expanded. Another 30% that it that uh, it should be kept as is, but they're basically strong support for the law. Uh, independents somewhat more evenly divided, uh, and Republicans um, uh, strongly opposed. Um, with about 35% uh, reporting that uh, the, re the, the bill should be repealed and not replaced with anything. I think uh, it's also interesting to note that uh, a, a large portion, 25% of independents, uh, share that perspective as well. So Kaiser also asked questions about uh, individual provisions of the bill to see whether or not there's some aspects of the bill where there's broader, broad support uh, uh, and others where maybe support is, is not as, as strong. Um, and although this is not the complete comprehensive list here, this is sort of, I think, a good indication of the fact that many of the aspects of the bill um, are there is quite strong support for. So tax credits to small business, um, closing the Medicare donut hole, uh, guaranteeing issue of insurance policies, providing financial help for low and moderate income uh, Americans. Uh, there's fairly strong support for these provisions of the bill. Uh, you, where you begin to see uh, some drop off is uh, in uh, with regard to increasing the Medicare payroll tax on the wealthy, there's still a majority of people um, polled support that provision, but you can see that it's dropped from the 70s down to 58%. And again, not surprising in terms of the, the uh, uh, sort of the information and specifically the legal challenges that have been mounted against the reform bill. You can see that for the individual mandate, uh, a vast majority of those polled uh, uh, feel that this is the, the one provision of health care reform that should be repealed. Now looking at this, uh, breaking uh, this down a little bit more uh, by political party um, reveals some interesting um, uh, trends as well. Now this, I, I uh, realize that this table is um, has a lot of information and is uh, a little complicated, but if we look at, for example, the tax credits to small businesses, um, even among those who want to repeal the bill, there's 68% report that uh, they would like to keep this this provision of the bill. So they're against health care reform overall, but this is a uh, they view this as a valuable component. Obviously, for people who want to keep the bill, 92% uh, view this as, as an important component. Um, and guaranteed issue and closing the Medicare donut hole also have strong support among people who want to, to repeal the bill. When we get down to financial help for low and moderate income Americans, uh, Again, even among those who want to repeal the bill, there's a, uh, a 
plurality report uh, support for this provision. It's only when we get down to the last two provisions, the increase in the Medica Medicare payroll tax uh, and the individual mandate, where uh, those who want to repeal the bill specifically are targeting these, these uh, provisions of the bill for elimination. But what I find even more fascinating is that among those who want to keep health care reform, 50% report that they want to repeal the individual mandate. So when, and if you continue looking across the uh, affiliation by party, even among uh, Democrats, 48% um, of Democrats report that they uh, are opposed to the individual mandate. So we know that there are legal challenges out there to the legislation as a whole, and most of those legal challenges are focused on the individual mandate. Um, you can see that popular support uh, for that specific provision of the bill is as uh, is is quite weak. Uh, finally, uh, Kaiser asked a uh, a few general questions, not specifically related to health care reform, but about um, the role of government and. Uh, and testing attitudes about what the appropriate role of government is. And I think what's, what's interesting uh, in this slide is uh, if we focus on the third item, uh, reducing poverty, 64% uh, of people surveyed um, in March, in, I'm sorry, this, this survey dates back to September and October, but 64% uh, indicate that reducing poverty um, is an appropriate role of government and that there should be more involvement. Uh, another 17% report that there should be the same amount of involvement. So almost 80% of people polled say that reducing poverty is an important role for the government and a vast majority of those uh, believe that the government should be doing more. Now, the reason I call attention to this is that this is one aspect of health care reform that um, is, uh, has not been discussed widely. Uh, and it's quite clear that support, the premium support, in fact, uh, can be an effective mechanism in improving the financial status, not necessarily the income, but at least the, the financial status of low in, and moderate income uh, Americans. Uh, and yet there's not as broad support for health care reform as there is for reducing poverty. And then uh, a, another question that, that Kaiser asked is which groups benefit um, and uh, the perception of individuals surveyed is um, uh, seems to be relatively accurate and on target. Lower income Americans are going to benefit. The uninsured will, will benefit. Uh, people with pre-existing medical con conditions will benefit. Uh, uh, a majority of, of those polled um, uh, indicate that, that uh, those, those groups will benefit from health care reform. Uh, less support for or uh, fewer people concluding that the country as a whole will benefit. Um, middle class Americans, only a third reporting that they or their families will benefit, um, and um, uh, slightly less indicating that the Medicare program and businesses will benefit from the bill. Uh, finally, and, and uh, this this will be my um, closing uh, slide, uh, uh, the uh, in light of, of the, the, the last couple slides that I presented, I, I just wanted to remind um, everyone about where Americans stand with regard to their insurance status uh, as a function of income expressed as a percentage of federal poverty level. Um, and um, clearly for, for families at 400% of, of the federal poverty level and above, um, only about 5% of individuals in that income category um, are uninsured. And you can see in the slide that your likelihood of being uninsured begins to increase dramatically as you s sort of go down the income ladder. Now, 
the other thing that I find fascinating in this in this uh, debate over health care reform and ongoing challenges is that um, going back to the previous slide, only about a third of Americans uh, indicate that they think that the bill will benefit them, but two-thirds of Americans live below 400 percent of the federal poverty level. So there's a little bit of a disconnect between what people's actual income status is and their potential eligibility, for example, for, um, for subsidies in the exchange. And I think that one of the reasons that disconnect is, is occurring is that people who are currently um, uh, have low or, or middle incomes and are insured um, are not thinking at this point that health reform is going to benefit them because they already have insurance. I think that one of the most difficult messages that has not been communicated to uh, or has not been received by a majority of, of Americans is that uh, if I lose my current employment-based insurance, I may in fact need to have the support uh, or the subsidy to buy insurance through the exchange. Um, I don't think that, that, that people necessarily see that that's something that's going to happen or that they will be eligible. Uh, and as a result, because they may be insured at this point in time, uh, they believe that the bill is not going to impact them. So I think one of the, the, the ongoing challenges here is uh, communicating the potential benefits and the protections in the bill uh, to people who are viewing it right now as well. I have insurance and therefore I'm not going to benefit um, and so I'm indifferent or perhaps think that we're going to be, I'm going to be worse off rather than uh, I may in fact need this protection at some point in the future and it will be there for me. So what I'd like to do is uh, stop here and um, open it up for questions and uh, and for discussion. There are a lot of a lot of issues regarding the legal challenges that I didn't go into in any detail, but I'm happy to uh, discuss during the Q and A. So, um, so thank um, you, Jerry. Thank if you, you have, have, have a question, a question, just type, type it, it uh, in the text, text box, box on the left, on the side, left side of your side screen, of screen. Um, and uh, Jerry will see it there and take it. In the meantime, Jerry, while we wait for those questions to be posted, could you talk more about those legal challenges, especially to the individual mandate? Okay, Jerry, it looks like we have some questions. Um, can you, are you, are you, is your mic on? Can you turn your mic on? I'm sorry. I, I didn't realize that my mic was off. So uh, I'll start over and answer uh, Carla's original question about the legal challenges. Um, and I apologize if this is repetitive. Uh, so there are currently five cases that have been decided, three in favor of the bill, upholding the bill, two um, uh, uh, against the uh, reform bill. Uh, I'm not a legal expert. I'm certainly not a constitutional law expert. But my, as an informed um, sort of observer of this process, um, I find it uh, difficult to understand how a legal challenge to the constitutionality of the bill is going to survive. Um, and that's not to say that I'm predicting that, that uh, this will be upheld if it gets to the Supreme Court. I think that it is going to have to be resolved by the Supreme Court. Um, I think the court, uh, the current composition of the court, it, I could see um, a decision against reform and specifically against the individual mandate. But my understanding uh, is that uh, the individual mandate is completely consistent with the Commerce Clause of the Constitution. Uh, and I do know that um, uh, conservatives over the years have railed against liberals who they believe have legislated from the bench. My feeling is that if this law is overturned by the Supreme Court, that it's going to be because 
conservative justices have decided that this is their chance to legislate from the bench and to ignore over 100 years of case law supporting the Commerce Clause. But that's my uh, informed judgment, not legal opinion. Uh, so, Carla, would you like me to uh, uh, take the questions, the questions that have been taken now? Yeah, so if you just want to maybe read the question so it's posted on the website that uh, people can know what you're talking about. Uh, so the first question from John Eldon is, uh, how can uh, the bill work without mandatory coverage, in other words, without the mandate, pre-existing condi condition coverage only for those who have been buying insurance and paying into the system, uh, not for those who wait to get sick? Uh, I don't think that, I, I think that without the mandate that we do face some challenges, but um, there are options to the individual mandate. Um, and one of them is what is currently done in the Medicare program. Uh, when you sign, when you enroll in Medicare at age 65 um, and you go to the Social Security office to sign up for Part A, you're asked if you want to participate in Medicare Part B. And the reason you're asked that is because when you elect to participate in Medicare Part B, you then pay a monthly premium. It's about $100 a month now for most beneficiaries. It, it's uh, um, uh, income scale now, so some beneficiaries pay more, but the vast majority pay about $100 a month, and that amounts withheld from your Social Security check. Uh, if you choose to decline Part B coverage at the time you join Medicare, but then decide later that you want the coverage, you, you change your mind basically, and you now see the, the value of that. Um, you can you can get Part B coverage, but you now pay a higher premium, and you pay a higher premium that's basically actuarially equivalent to the premiums that you did not pay uh, when you were supposed to be enrolled. Um, Switzerland and um, uh, the Netherlands, which both have systems very similar to the reform that we've enacted in this country employ a similar mechanism. Uh, so basically it's not a mandate uh, as much as uh, you are penalized if you uh, sit outside the system uh, when you decide that you want to be, uh, that you now need insurance and of course because of a guaranteed issue um, you have to be issued insurance. You will pay a higher premium based on the number of years that you sat outside the system. I think that that's one effective mechanism uh, if, in fact, the individual mandate does not survive either because of the legal challenges or, as we saw in the, the polling data that I discussed earlier, uh, the lack of popular support even among Democrats who are strongly supportive of the, the bill overall. Um, Kent has a question. Can I shed some light on the $105 billion that were included in the bill? This was recently brought uh, to the attention of the public by some representatives of Congress. Uh, I don't, uh, Kent, if you can uh, elaborate on that, I'm not sure what you're referring to. Uh, the bill, uh, the financing for the bill is um, on the order of about a trillion dollars over 10 years. So I'm not, not sure what the $105 billion are that you're referring to. Um, I'll come back to that if you can uh, provide a little bit of clarifying information. Uh, Grace's question is, I've talked about the bill will affect non-elderly Americans. Can I talk about how it impacts the elderly? Sure. Uh, uh, the impact on the Medicare population, uh, I, I alluded to the fact that we're closing the donut hole uh, and that a, last year an estimated 350,000 Californians uh, received rebate checks. Um, this year, all beneficiaries uh, are no longer subject to co-payments and deductibles for um, uh, uh, preventive services. Uh, the major impacts on the Medicare program, uh, and going back to how this bill is financed, is that almost half of the financing over 10 years, uh, close to $500 billion of the financing for health care reform, comes from reductions 
in payments to uh, most providers of Medicare services uh, with the exception of doctors. Uh, those reductions are not uh, cuts in Medicare payments below existing levels, but it is a slowing in the rate of growth of Medicare uh, payments over the next decade. Um, in addition, there's a reduction in payments to hospitals for uncompensated care because the expectation is, is that hospitals will, with uh, a substantial increase in the number of insured patients, that hospitals will not need support uh, as much support for uncompensated care because there'll be substantially fewer uninsured patients seeking care at hospitals. So um, there is concern, and if you look at um, uh, the polling data among Medicare beneficiaries, uh, there's the general perception uh, and among Medicare beneficiaries that health reform is not, um, does not produce uh, benefits for the Medicare population. Uh, and I believe and I interpret that, that result to indicate that the reductions in payments to hospitals and other providers over the next decade are creating concern that access to care may be affected. Um, over time, uh, and I think there's a gen generalized concern and anxiety among Medicare beneficiaries about uh, those reductions in payments. Uh, the next question, Randy uh, has a question th that says, support for eliminating pre-existing condition exclusions, but opposition to individual mandates suggests that most don't understand how the two are linked, that you're absolutely right. Are you aware of any efforts to improve understanding, or are there alternative approaches to the individual mandate that still? Well, I, I did talk about one option. Um, in terms of efforts to improve understanding, let me comment on that more generally. Uh, I think what we've seen here um, over the last year is we've enacted a major piece of, of social legislation. Um, if we were to characterize it, it's uh, uh, Social Security, I think, is was the the greatest piece of of social legislation in terms of social insurance, followed by Medicare, followed by health care reform, and I'm talking both in terms of dollars and in terms of of the number of Americans potentially affected by these programs. Uh, in contrast to the Medicare program, which was enacted in uh, uh, July of 1965 and went into effect 12 months later. This reform bill um, was enacted uh, a year ago, and its major provisions uh, and the major beneficiaries of the bill um, will not go into effect for almost three more years. What this has done is created a unique opportunity uh, for the opposition to mount a campaign to unravel delay and destroy the bill. Uh, the Medicare program, when it, was, uh, when it went into effect a year after enactment, had 19 million beneficiaries enrolled in receiving benefits within 12 months of the bill being enacted. Um, I, earlier in my talk, I referred to the fact that although there are important patient protections that have gone into place that potentially could benefit millions, if not uh, tens or hundreds of millions of, of Americans. The fact is that many of the protections that are in place one year later are potential protections. So let's just look at, for example, the, the elimination of lifetime limits. My probability of exceeding a lifetime limit, if I had one, is still in any given year relatively small. None of us want to be the person who exceeds their lifetime limit, but the fact is it's a rel relatively rare event. As a result, although this is providing genuine protection and real benefit to a, a small percentage of Americans today, um, it's nowhere on the order of the number of beneficiaries who immediately benefited from Medicare a year after it was enacted. And I think that politically what this has done has created a challenge which is a little difficult to to solve at this point because 
the timetable for implementation will be difficult to speed up at this point without other major legislation. Um, but if we have to wait three more years for the major benefits of the bill to go in effect, that's three years. Uh, it gives opponents to the bill three years to continue to mount opposition and pick away um, at the, the real um, uh, benefits of the program. Um, the next question is, um, as an economist, do I think that the ACA will reduce the cost of health care premiums in the short term and long term? And what about the impact on health care spending? Well, this gets back to the issue of will health care reform bend the cost curve? Uh, in the short term, I don't think that it bends the cost curve um, because there is no way to um, increase the number of insured. Um, and what I'm referring to now is starting in 2014, to increase the number of people who now have insurance and uh, lower cost at the same time. The, I think the expectation is that over time, as uh, fewer, as there are fewer uninsured Americans, as people receive regular health care, uh, that long-term cost and long-term long-term cost will be lower and long-term health and productivity will be higher because we've closed the gap uh, that's existed for, for decades in, in this country between the insured and the uninsured. Um, but I don't think that we're going to see the bending of that cost curve uh, until the program has been in, in effect for a while. Uh, the next question is, uh, what would be the effect on individuals who are not citizens or legal residents? Um, quite, just to, to put it quite simply, um, uh, they are not uh, included or protected uh, under health care reform. Um, the undocumented uh, and even legal residents who've been here for uh, less than five years um, are not eligible for uh, most of the provisions of health care reform. The only benefit, um, which is an indirect benefit, is the increased funding under the bill for federally qualified health centers, um, which are largely responsible for, for providing um, health care to the uninsured, including the undocumented. Um, so there will be an increase in the capacity and sort of the infrastructure for providing safety net services as a result of this dramatic increase in funding for federally qualified health centers. Um, but the undocumented are not allowed to participate in the exchange, um, even if they pay for the premiums 100% out of their own pocket. Um, so it is a, an unfortunate aspect in, of, the, of the bill uh, that the, the undocumented are really left uh, virtually completely on the sidelines. Um, the next question is, this is the follow-up information from Kent that I requested. Michelle Bachman recently asked for research to be done to identify why $105 billion was not debated when the bill was introduced and now asked that it be defined. That, that's how Kent understands the issue. Um, okay. Uh, I'm sorry to uh, admit uh, that I do not pay attention to a single thing that Michelle Bachman says, so I have no idea what she's referring to. Um, in this, um, but I'm uh, will now be motivated to try and find out what the 105 billion dollars that um, apparently she claims was uh, introduced to the bill under some sort of um, less than uh, transparent process. But I, I really have no idea what that refers to. So. Not in a position of comment. Jerry, we have just a couple Jerry, minutes left, but I wonder in, in, in the remaining time if you could address um, efforts address to defund efforts the bill to and, and what impact that that could have. Sure. Uh, sure. Um, 
this is a little this is a very gray area because I, I don't think that anybody um, that I've talked to um, uh, in the House or Senate fully understands what all the possible options are. Uh, we do know that, uh, and I know this from attending a, a conference about a month ago in D.C., that the Republicans in the House are committed to repealing the bill. And when asked a direct question, um, uh, well, are there aspects of this bill that you may want to support and keep and others to, you know, to get rid of or to modify, um, House Republican staffers said, we are committed to repealing health care reform. And that was the only response that they they gave. So um, I'm not sure that we know the full extent to which uh, a Republican-dominated House will be able to block funding for certain provisions. What I do know is that uh, a lot of the funding for, uh, for infrastructure development, for rate review, for uh, support for the states to begin to develop exchanges, that that money is still available. Uh, but what we've seen is uh, that uh, a number of states are not moving forward. And it's the states that have filed, that have participated in the lawsuits challenging the constitutionality. So what we've seen is sort of basically a response on the part of somewhere around 26 or 27 states of Let's slow the process down. Let's uh, let the Republicans in the House try to slow the process down and see if we can um, uh, bring this this uh, bill um, to a standstill by um, politically delaying as much as possible. Um, and I think that that strategy is likely to continue throughout this year um, and will could possibly continue into next year as well. Jerry, thank, thank you so much. Jerry, we thank are, you out so much. We are out of time, and the webinar and will be posted on the School of Public Health website in a couple of days if you missed the very beginning. The very beginning. Um, our, next um, our next webinar is scheduled for Wednesday, April 20th. Professor Hector Rodriguez will talk about innovations in healthcare delivery systems research. We hope you can log on and join the conversation. Have a great day.